Inspiration is a powerful motivator for furthering one's achievements and ambitions, but it can easily become plagiarism. Some argue that the Roman Empire was built not only by grain, bloodshed and slaves, but by frauds. Many of their tactics came from the Greeks, their naval power from the Carthaginians, and their knowledge of horses from the Persians. While their empire consisted of many cultures, and though it is wise to acknowledge the superior skills of one's enemies and use them to your advantage, it is important to ensure that the dominant power's culture, their ideology is superior, something that one man attempted to do from the depths of the Grand Canyon. In his early life, he was Edward Solo, but soon came to call himself Caesar. In the southwest corner of the once United States lies the ruined skeletal city of Los Angeles. In the years following the Great War of 2077, the boneyard was founded amongst the ruins. Survivors, gangs and unscrupulous folk called it home. In 2189, it became one of the many locations under control of the democratic New California Republic. It soon became one of the largest and prosperous cities in their territory, but by 2281, it still had a long way to go. In 2226, however, a couple there had a son, Edward Solo. It is said life in the boneyard was hard, even by wasteland standards, an unideal place for a child growing up, as Edward would soon find out. Two years later, his father was killed by raiders, and his mother fled the city with her child, and found shelter amongst the followers of the apocalypse. The followers were dedicated to humanitarian aid, and the keeping as well as sharing of knowledge. They welcomed almost anyone to their ranks, and when Edward's mother came across their symbol, she found solace with them. The followers took them in. Edward's mother took to cleaning and cooking in their library, while her son was given a place to grow up, as well as something rare in the wasteland, an education. He learned to read and soon began taking courses. He proved to be a smart yet petulant boy. Though he spent most of his adolescence with the followers, he never felt like he was one of them. He considered them too naive and longed for escape, another purpose. In 2246, at the age of 20, Edward and nine followers were sent east towards Arizona to study the various tribes that had emerged following the Great War. Solo specialised in anthropology and linguistics, though later he would see learning tribal dialects as a complete waste of time. Also joining him was a physician called Bill Calhoun, and soon the expedition of nine became one of ten when they met with a Mormon missionary from New Canaan to the north, Joshua Graham. Graham was fluent in a number of tribal dialects, thus was perfect as a translator. The expedition continued on and eventually found the tribes they searched for, but Edward's curiosity and excitement turned into disgust. He despised the primitiveness of the tribals, considered them inferior, and looked down on their petty scuffles and routine atrocities. He began to see the wasteland in a new light, aided by a recent discovery. The expedition had come across a cache of well-preserved historical texts, and Edward took to cataloguing and studying them. It wasn't until he read the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and Gaius Julius Caesar's very own commentary, that both his and thousands of others' lives 
would change, though for many, for the worst. In Gaius, he saw a hero, a man who carved out a career full of both political and military achievements. Edward then concluded that he would change the course of his life, and do so by any means necessary. The commentary would act as a blueprint for his vision, and who but him would know that his ideas weren't original. At some point in 2247, the expedition found the Blackfoot tribe, deep in the Grand Canyon. The Blackfoots are said by unconfirmed sources to have originated from a former military group that was stranded after the Great War. With the soldiers not knowing how to farm, raiding soon became their way of survival. At first, things seemed to be going well with the tribe, but soon took a turn for the worse. Either by a mistranslation or spout of trickery, the followers were taken hostage for ransom. However, the Blackfoots were at war with seven other tribes, and were quickly losing. Not wanting to die along with the tribe, and against the objections of Calhoun, Edward used his knowledge of warfare to teach the Blackfoots how to conduct it successfully. He taught them how to use, clean and maintain weapons, how to make explosives, and how to utilize small unit tactics. He then showed them the meaning of divide and conquer, to strike their weakest enemies first and continue on until none are left. The Blackfoots were impressed with him, so much that he was made their leader, and Solo led them to a victory against the Ridgers tribe. Joshua Graham decided to join him, while Calhoun was sent back to the followers with knowledge of what Edward was doing, as well as a message to not interfere. The other members of the expedition were executed, and the Blackfoots continued on to conquest and grand victories. The tribes had known warfare on a small skirmish scale, but Edward wanted to show them total war, real war. Warfare in its most horrifying, destructive and barbaric state. When the Ridgers refused to surrender, he ordered every man, woman and child killed, and their corpses piled high. They then marched on the Kaibabs. They too refused to surrender, but this time Solo led their emissary back to the Ridgers settlement and showed them the display of corpses. It sent a great shock through the envoy's mind as the concept of total war was new and terrifying to the tribes who had only played at war. The Kaibabs quickly surrendered, fearing their own destruction. So too did the Fredonians, and finally the rest of the Blackfoot's enemies all apparently fell in line. Around the time following the final of the Blackfoot's enemy's surrender, when Solo considered his confederacy large enough, he crowned himself Caesar, and formed what would become one of the Wasteland's most feared and powerful forces, the Legion. Realising that the main cause of the issues the various tribes had was their tribal identities, Edward, now Caesar, felt he had to completely erase these identities, and replace them with a single culture, one tribe, with one leader at the head of it all. He believed that uniting the wasteland under a single banner was the key to surviving this harsh world and that individual identities had no place for facing it. With this in mind, he established his faction, his very own Roman Empire, Caesar's Legion. The concept of the Romans as a model for the Legion fitted what Caesar saw as the status quo of the American wasteland. The Roman Empire's ability to assimilate those it conquered was also appealing, as it effectively erased cultural identities through its militarized autocracy. It was also alien to the tribes he subjugated, 
allowing him to continue the charade that this identity was his own. Rome also dedicated its citizens to the very idea of Rome itself. Caesar believed that his legion could provide the world with a society to prevent mankind from destroying itself again, provide long-term stability, regardless of the cost. It would create a nation where the individual is nothing more than a tool to be utilized for war or production, though there's an argument that that has been the case for humanity for a very long time, even in the world before its destruction. However, Rome became a template for his legion, and this concept would most likely only hold for as long as Edward's charade was intact. Aside from defeat, his greatest fear was being exposed as a fraud, for in 2250, he proclaimed himself the Son of Mars, the Roman God of War, and that the customs of the Legion were from Mars himself passed on to Caesar. This gave the cause weight amongst his followers and attracted loyalty, something the Legion would have in abundance a fundamental aspect to its success and survival, though that loyalty was mostly to Caesar himself, and predominantly out of fear. The brutality of what was done to the Ridgers would become a staple of the Legion, fear one of its greatest weapons. The translator, Joshua Graham, soon went from translating to giving orders to leading men. He became Caesar's right hand, his first legatus, and would be the spearhead of the legion's brutality and terror. Caesar's legion was an imperialistic totalitarian slaver society that held questionable customs and cruel organization. It was a slave army with a very strict hierarchy, where its members are purposed with one thing, fighting for Caesar until their last breath. Caesar didn't tolerate defeat, nor defiance or corruption, regardless of one station. Those guilty were heavily punished, even by legion standards in some instances. Like the Romans and others of old, crucifixion was a prevalent form of execution. Able-bodied males born under the legion were taken from their mothers and became soldiers of Caesar. Despite the fact both sexes were subjugated by Caesar, the women had it worse. The females of the legion acted in support roles, for they were forbidden from fighting. They were healers, cooks, midwives and breeders to continuously bring new life into the legion. A great number of the legion considered women lesser than slaves, and often treated them as such. For those outside of the proper legion, the subjects, Caesar is considered cruel but well-meaning. While having limited freedom and living life in fear of the Legion's brutality, they enjoyed its protection and the prosperity it apparently brought. Traders, caravan merchants spoke highly of the benefits of working under the Legion, especially when it came to raiders and other hostile humans, though its benefits to some seemed to not be enough for many. Certain slaves and perhaps all of the women in the Legion would rather have seen it all burn and suffer a lack of peace than serve its master. As the years went on since its formation, the brutal society of tribesmen would go on to expand across Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico and Utah, dominating various tribes as it went. Five years later, in 2255, Caesar established the first capital of his legion in the ruins of Flagstaff, Arizona. Though tribes were forcibly assimilated into the legion and enslaved, there were towns and cities within legion territory that were just controlled by the legion. They were not slaves, but they weren't free. However, it was said that life under the legion was better than it was before them though it's rare someone under their banner would have dared say otherwise. For the next 25 or so years, Caesar and his legion would expand, conquer and enslave. By 2280, 
He had conquered 86 tribes with little resistance, and the legion's expansion never ceased. Tribes such as the Hydebacks, home of the infamous Legate Lanius, and the Hand Dogs, the eventual Hound Masters of the Legion, were conquered, but those such as the Twin Mothers were exterminated, with bitter drink being one of the few things that remains of their legacy. Decades of warfare and assimilation forged the Legion into a deadly force to be reckoned with, but that all came to a halt once the Bull set its sights towards Nevada, the Mojave Desert, and the City of Light contained within. In the 2270s, the New California Republic began making its way into the Mojave Desert, while Caesar's Legion was also moving west towards the Colorado River. In 2273, Corporal Sterling of the NCR Rangers was captured and tortured by Caesar's Legionaries. Sterling managed to escape and was rescued by fellow Rangers. In 2274, NCR scouts reached Hoover Dam, prompting the self-styled president of New Vegas, Mr. House, to establish the three families of Vegas and present to the NCR the New Vegas Treaty. Hoover Dam soon powered up, New Vegas lit up like a pre-war Christmas tree, and the Strip was open for business. NCR military forces began moving into the Mojave, and a year later, Legion scouts reported everything back to Caesar, and he was not happy. Like Mr. House, Caesar considered democracy an ineffective failed experiment that allows corruption and greed to thrive, an ideology where the few prosper and the many stagnate. He despised consumerism and saw it as a way to turn people into sheep living only to survive rather than living to achieve. Caesar desired a world where humans were judged solely by their merit, not their wealth or ancestry. The NCR was the very antithesis of this, just as the Legion was the antithesis of them. With conflicting ideologies and very little in common, conflict between the two seemed inevitable, especially given Caesar's ambition and his twisted view of the world once he saw Hoover Dam and the flag beyond it. In 2275 and 76, the Legion gradually assembled east of the Colorado River. The NCR now became aware of the threat when their scouting parties failed to return from the east. The Bull was now marching toward them. Caesar saw Hoover Dam as a strategic asset that would allow the Legion to cross the river in great numbers and claim the city of New Vegas. Its tall structures and bright lights convinced the dictator that this conquest would elevate the Legion from a tribe to an organized empire. It would be its Rome, and Caesar saw the NCR as a worthy adversary. Finally, something big enough to challenge him. By the time the Legion established a base at Fortification Hill in 2277, small skirmishes had occurred between the two societies. One of note was the destruction of Fort Aradesh, now aptly named Fort Abandon. Joshua Graham earned a fearful reputation amongst the NCR, legendary for being difficult to kill. It all came to a massive clash when Legion forces under the command of the First Legate assaulted the NCR in the First Battle of Hoover Dam. The Legion appeared to have the upper hand in the first half of the battle, partially due to the incompetence of General Lee Oliver, as many have said repeatedly. Although, due to Graham's blindness in his success, his and the Legion's lack of adaptability and the strategic mind of Chief Hanlon of the NCR Rangers, the battle was lost, and many soldiers of Caesar with it in the rubble of Boulder City. This devastating defeat infuriated Caesar, who wholly blamed Graham for its result, to show that failure would not be tolerated no matter where in the hierarchy you were. 
He had his old friend Joshua Graham covered in pitch, set ablaze, and tossed off the edge of the Grand Canyon. However, to Caesar's dismay, Graham survived. Burned, twisted, and broken, he would eventually return home to New Canaan, killing legionaries as he went, cementing the myth of the burned man. Caesar forbade anyone speaking the name Joshua Graham under the penalty of death. He was marked the burned man, and a good number in the legion spoke of him as a vengeful spirit. But Caesar knew the truth, and the return of Graham became a great fear of his. It caused him to, perhaps also in an act of desperation, later order the destruction of everything related to the former legate. Caesar fooled others, and perhaps himself, into thinking that the first battle of Hoover Dam was lost purely by the incompetence of Graham, but rarely ever is it that simple. While Caesar may have boasted about achieving his ultimate goal by any means necessary, the Legion's military tactics held them back in a world where gunpowder and ballistic weaponry reigned supreme. Like the inevitable chaos of World War I, the Legion's tactics were not up to scratch with the current day technology. Thus, history repeats itself. Or perhaps, mankind does. They considered the use of firearms cowardly, but some have argued that in war, it matters not what tools are used, only victory, something Caesar himself acknowledged. With that in mind, their failure at the First Battle of Hoover Dam could be unsurprising, to say the least. When the smoke cleared, and Joshua Graham was ejected, Legate Lanius, the monster of the East, warrior of the Hyde Barks, replaced Graham as Caesar's second, and who embarked on a conquest of the East to assimilate or destroy more tribes, to replenish the Legion's numbers in preparation for a second confrontation with the NCR. For the next four years, Caesar rebuilt his army, expanded his dominance in the east, planned his second assault, and analyzed who in the Mojave he could bring into his fold. While the legion's power increased, however, Caesar himself was on the decline. Over time, his face had changed. He became sickly, reclusive, and suffered from periodically intense headaches affecting his ability to lead. He had a brain tumour. While he tried to hide this from his soldiers, those closest to him knew something was wrong. But any mention of it enraged the dictator, and for a while, nothing else came of it. But some feared that Caesar was dying, and those such as Frumentarius Vulpes Inculta, and Graham himself felt that if Caesar died, so too would the Legion. By 2281, Caesar's Legion had regained its power and gradually weakened the bear. The Republic in the Mojave was slowly being chipped away by surprise attacks, betrayal, and the Frumentari, Caesar's intelligence officers. Morale was falling within the NCR's army, and they slowly lost territory for the Legion was already across the Colorado River, and in greater numbers than their enemies thought. It first began with the Battle of Willow Beach. The NCR's Camp Willow to the east of the Colorado was assaulted and successfully destroyed by the Legion. Then came the Battle of Arizona Spillway, the Legion yet again successful, and this finally eradicated the NCR presence east of the Colorado River. Afterwards came the move into the Mojave with the Battle of Nelson. Legion forces under the command of Decanus Dead Sea launched a surprise attack on the NCR at the settlement. This eventually led to a stalemate between the Legion at Nelson and the NCR at Camp Forlorn Hope, where morale was almost completely broken and casualties high, hence its name. Following these battles, the Legion managed to establish a base at Cottonwood Cove, on the western side of the river. They proceeded to launch small skirmishes here and there to prod, weaken, and instill fear in the NCR. 
Caesar's troops managed to slaughter the troops at Ranger Station Charlie near Nova, decimate Camp Searchlight by opening stored containers of deadly radioactive waste, killing and ghoulifying almost everyone there. But one of their more notorious strikes, however, was the extermination of the town of Nipton. Nipton was said to be a corrupted town of thieves, gamblers and prostitutes under the leadership of a Mayor Joseph B. Stein. Both NCR soldiers and criminal powder gangers were catered to. Stein planned to turn over both the NCR and gangers to the Legion via Vulpes and Coulter, but the Frumentarius had a better idea. Vulpes and other members of the Legion held the town hostage and carried out a lottery. The winner lived, the runner-up was crippled, and the third and fourth place winners became slaves, whereas some losers were decapitated, while others, including Mayor Stein, were burned alive on a pile of tires, and the unlucky rest were crucified. This was yet another atrocity for Caesar to use to demoralise his enemies and keep his own subjects in line. They say the fires of Nipton burned for a long time. Towards the end of 2281, the Legion were almost ready to assault the dam once more, but Caesar wanted to tie up potential problems before he would give the order. Beneath Fortification Hill, was the Securitron vault housing Mr. House's army of Securitrons. Caesar wanted to know what was there and destroy it, as well as Mr. House himself. He also wanted to eradicate the Brotherhood of Steel chapter in the Mojave and forge an alliance with the Boomers, Great Khans, and the once cannibalistic White Glove Society, or eliminate them if no deal was struck. But, Possibly partially thanks to Caesar, a surprising variable entered the scene, one that would decide the outcome of the approaching second battle of Hoover Dam and change the Mojave for decades to come. Following 2277, yet before 2281, Caesar's legion had conquered its 87th tribe, the Twisted Hairs of Drywells. They were once a powerful tribe in Arizona that allied with the legion. Caesar rewarded their aid with treachery, conquering and enslaving them as he had done with so many before. One of the Twisted Hairs' best scout was a courier named Ulysses. Drywell's pacification was a painful moment for the scout, but he remained loyal to Caesar. He walked many roads for him, reporting on enemies and potential assets, and was one of the first in the Legion to discover Hoover Dam. Eventually, Ulysses came across a prosperous community in a place called The Divide, and he believed it could become a homeland for him. However, the NCR had gotten there first. They annexed it and used it to supply their forces in the Mojave, which naturally caught the attention of Caesar. Caesar dispatched a small army to the Divide in an attempt to cut off the NCR supply line and give the Legion more time to recover. Fortunately and unfortunately for the Legion, and also unfortunately for the NCR and all within the Divide, a package arrived containing a nuclear detonation device that awoke the missiles beneath Hopeville and Ashton. That day, the Divide truly earned its name following the death and destruction that occurred when a number of the warheads detonated, killing most of the inhabitants and turning those that survived into ghouls, except for Ulysses. The scout returned to Caesar learning what had become of the first battle of Hoover Dam. The dictator then sent Ulysses on a mission north to the Great Salt Lake in Utah, where he would oversee the Whitelegs tribe. The tribe revered the Legion and willingly carried out Caesar's bidding, 
he agreed to allow the White Legs into the Legion on the condition that they destroyed NCR supply lines in Utah and wiped out the settlement of New Canaan and its people. However, it appeared that Caesar's ultimate goal in this was hope that the White Legs would utterly eradicate all traces of Joshua Graham from the earth, including his home of New Canaan and the tribes of Zion Canyon he associated with. Ulysses would then go on to leave the Legion behind and usher in the wild card that would change the entire Mojave for years to come, the courier who was shot in the head. The courier would go on to become one of the most influential characters in the Mojave Wasteland and whoever gained their support in the war for Hoover Dam would have surely been victorious. The Second Battle of Hoover Dam eventually occurred in 2281 and it is said to have been a fierce fight. Some say that not only were the Legion and the NCR involved, but so too were Mr. House's Securitrons, the Boomers, Brotherhood of Steel, even remnants of the Enclave. But of course, battle reports often conflict and none of these might be true. Reports also came to light that during the battle, other fights across the Mojave were being fought. Details of the battle are still to this day unclear, and it is not known who exactly the victor was. Some believe that even without the help of the courier, the Legion would have been defeated yet again by the NCR. While the Legion's strategy may have changed since the first battle, little else did. Some, such as follower Arcade Ganon, say that Caesar did nothing but disregard human history and every lesson there was to learn from it, that he twisted everything to his world view and took Hegelian dialectics as scientific theory. But Hegelian dialectics is a philosophy where conflict between the thesis and antithesis is inevitable, said to be good for it paves the way for a synthesis that would change both the NCR and the Legion. On the contrary, in the first battle of Hoover Dam, the thesis and antithesis met. One lost, the other barely won, and yet none changed beyond a shuffle in leadership. The NCR snipers proved to be too great a match for the Legion, but Caesar never employed something new to combat this obstacle. The Legion cared little for firearms and considered their use cowardly and not honourable. Some say that the Legion's stance on firearms and enhanced technology made them weaker, but the result of the attrition following the first battle of Hoover Dam also made the NCR weaker. It is ironic that Caesar promoted melee combat and claimed pre-war contraptions that spare men from combat had no place in a post-war world. The Legion's military was about fighting the so-called honourable way, yet honourable combat, if there ever is such a thing, also has no place in a world such as this. And yet, the Legion boasted honour. But it is said that in war, there is no honour. And, as was proven on a number of occasions, treachery and espionage were not above the Legion. Caesar and his legion were inspired by the Romans of the BC era in many ways, and though much has changed since that era, human nature, it seems, has not. As history teaches, a lesson Caesar either forgot or never learnt, those like the legion are societies that live and die with their leaders. As it didn't have the right institutions in place, Without him, there was no legion, especially considering that people with his intellect are rare in the wasteland. With the legion being a highly militarized power like the Roman Empire, some say that it was doomed to fail right from the start, not including their tactics and stance on weaponry, for if the legion went on to conquer the entire wasteland, what then? What can the beast consume other than itself if there's nothing left to consume? Some agree that had they been able to penetrate the west, they wouldn't have been able to hold both it and the east. 
Most looked on the Legion as a symbol of the very evil the near destruction of mankind produced. But there are some who believe, despite its questionable aspects, that the Legion really was, at the end of it all, a good thing for the Wasteland. The very existence of Caesar's Legion presented the Wasteland the opportunity to look at itself and question whether or not they were repeating mistakes made before. Caesar himself presented new mistakes not to repeat. It is unknown what exactly happened to the dictator following the second battle of Hoover Dam. Perhaps the tumour finally ended his life. Or perhaps a more fiery ballistic method struck down the old follower. Or perhaps he lived on and saw the banner of the bull rise atop the towers of Hoover Dam and the city of New Vegas burning bright amidst the desert beyond. Whatever happened, there is one thing we can be sure of, that the wasteland will never forget Caesar and his legion, for better or for worse. After all, he could perhaps inspire others and teach them how to succeed where he may have failed. Caesar looked to the past for an idea on how to move forward. He sought to bring it back as he felt it was best equipped for the world he lived in, and put too much faith in Hegelian dialectics. But what he failed to realize or remember was that Rome itself failed, and the only thing inevitable in this world is death, for all things come to an end. Even an idea as big as Rome, even one as powerful and merciless as the Legion. Hello everyone, it's Josh, your Redbeak Raven, and thank you so much for watching what is the final Fallout lore video in this batch of Story of videos, and the final in the whole series. That is it, the 10th and conclusive episode in Batch 1. I've had a whale of a time making these for the past, unexpectedly, 7 or so months, and I hope you've enjoyed them and the wait was worth it. As I said in the last Elder Scrolls 1, if you watched that, I don't know when or if there will be another batch of these, but there will be a separate video updating you about that. I've got a bunch of recording outtakes that I'll probably shove together and upload, um, so hopefully that's at least amusing. And all I can really say now is thank you. Thank you very much for watching, sticking through the months waiting for these, the comments, the likes and shares, I appreciate all of it. So cheers for that, and that said, until next time, I'll see you then.